Hi, I'm Dean, and I'm also part of the Youth Collective at the British Museum. And today we're going to be talking about networking. It's something that can be quite daunting, especially if you're early in your career, if you're new to a sector. And that's what actually motivated us to run this event, really. Um, so to introduce our panellists. So um, our two panellists today, uh, we have Georgia. Um, George Mallon works in the Knowledge Share programme at the British Museum, working in partnership with other UK museums, galleries and cultural heritage organisations. Georgia creates opportunities for staff to share skills, best practice and expertise, helping to support the museum sector by strengthening the relationships between organisations and aiding colleagues across the country to collaborate and develop their professional networks. Georgia has worked at the British Museum for nine years, uh, for nearly nine years, <laughs> um, starting out in fundraising and then joining the national programmes team in 2016. Alongside her museum job, she is also a practising artist, working mainly in oil painting and drawing. She is passionate about social equity and finding ways to ensure that the arts are for everyone. And we're also joined by Isabel. Isabel is the founder of I Like Networking, a creative producer, public speaker and podcast host with over 15 years of experience in arts, culture and entertainment. Passionate about bringing diverse talent into the creative industry, from artists to arts managers. She's worked on a variety of non-profits, culture organisations and consumer-led companies, conceptualising and producing branded experiences that engage core consumers as well as communications campaigns. Having worked with clients such as Converse, Lipton, Red Bull and Lollapalooza, among others. She has created and sold an award-winning cultural agency based in Brazil, produced over 50 events a year, including international tours, and managing a roster of artists and a theatre company. In 2021, she was listed as one of the top 21 most influential women by Startups magazine and won a D and add awards in the side hustle category. And now on to the uh, main topic of our discussion today. Um, could I start by asking you both how you define networking? Um, yeah, so I literally only define networking as a relationship, a two-way relationship where people are exchanging ideas, collaborations, or you know, tips, skills, anything. So it's I like to think about network. We already have a network. It's like what we do with our friends already, but you extrapolate it into the professional realm, essentially. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with that. I think when I think about the definition of networking, these kind of two quite separate notions pop into my head. And the first one is the scary one that kind of occurs to me first, which is that it's someone working the room at an event and like effortlessly gliding between different clusters of people and just kind of merging and saying something kind of interesting and witty and like everyone loves them and then they move on to the next thing which is quite unattainable and, and I think very few people can do that um, without a lifetime's worth of practice and then the version that I think fits more closely to my actual experience which is it's just building relationships in a personal professional capacity um, so you're you know you're meeting people kind of representing you know, the work you do whether that's kind of you know, self-employed or for an institution, um, and you're meeting them as someone who does that kind of work, and you're building relationships with people who do more or less the same thing because you have shared interests, probably common goals, and you may well have things that you might want to collaborate on or share you know, knowledge about in the future. And that, to me, feels a lot less scary because you're just human beings talking to mm -hmm. each other. I mean, um, leading on from that then, um, do you consider networking to be an active or passive process? Like, do you think people should be actively going about trying to, trying to network with people within their field? Or do you think it should be a much more natural way? And what I mean by actively is like, do you think uh, through the means of such as LinkedIn, for example, like a very like uh, structured way of going about something? Uh, um, go to Isabel first. Yeah, um, I 
I'd say that networking is always kind of active because you are always putting part of yourself out there in the conversation. Like you don't net, I don't think you can network in a passive way. What I usually tell people is like jumping on what you said, Georgia. We connect with people, not job roles. So it's about bringing a little bit of our personality to the table and really showing up in whatever way we're doing. So if you're scrolling on Instagram, say, instead of scrolling for 10 minutes and liking 50 posts, it's better to just actually engage, comment, share something from three people that you actually care as opposed to just mindlessly being there like as a, like, you know, stalker or something because you don't really get much out of this. No conversations can start from that sort of uh, relationship. And the same like for LinkedIn, you can follow a ton of people, but if you just follow them that you're not actually networking, you're just adding, you know, content to your feed or whatever. So I'd say that networking is always active and there are tons of ways that you can go about it that feel organic and natural to you as opposed to something forced, like you go around you know, what I like to say is like, you don't need to go around trying to sell encyclopedias for people that use Google, you know, mm -hmm. like, so you don't, yeah. that there are, there are different ways to go about it that it's not like, you get a business card and you get a business <laughs> card, you know, like everybody gets a business card, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, relating to that, like, um, in terms of like, for example, I'm thinking LinkedIn, how do you remove that sort of um, idea that you are just sort of like, speaking to someone because you want something out of them because i think for example my friend calls linkedin the death of innocence <laughs> i mean he is an artist so he's quite pretentious but like uh, <laughs> no offense georgia no, there you go. <laughs> that's a very accurate um, observation um, but, um, but as in linkedin is a it's very much on this like as in they directly say that it is a platform where you are like networking with people in terms of trying to get something some people would say try to get something out of some someone else yeah um how do you remove that sort of make it remove the sort of stigma of sort of that that idea so, so i think first of all there's something to be said i think a lot of people confuse asking someone for something with being pushy or being demanding or being impolite or something and that's something I think a lot of people struggle with. Like, but basically in this world, if you don't ask, you don't get. And LinkedIn is a platform where people put themselves up there voluntarily to be connected with. So it removes already some of that pressure because everyone is there mm -hmm. with the idea that someone can reach out to them. And there's a big difference. Like if you send someone a message on LinkedIn, it's like 10 paragraphs about your life. And that's actually way more disrespectful because like who has the time to go through all of that and then think, but why is this person talking to me? <laughs> As opposed to someone being really clear, like, hey, this is what I like to do, this is why I'm getting in touch with you, like a personalized message that it's the person can easily say yes or no yeah. to you. That's a lot more valuable because you immediately get feedback from that and you're not wasting anyone's time. So I feel like there's a there are way there's ways to do it in that you don't feel like it's terrible and there's nothing wrong with a platform that puts themselves up there for exactly that purpose mm -hmm. and not necessarily what you want everyone is there trying to get out of people only like if there are those people out there and there's tons of really funny memes about LinkedIn of people like writing 10 paragraphs thinking NASA and Google Maps for passing their like driver's license and all that stuff and of course you're gonna see people like this yeah. but there is an approach that you can take where if you are talking to others, you can always, as I like to say it, flip it and always think about what is it that you could also offer your community. Mm -hmm. And I think that is such an easier way to start having conversations with people and to actually attract people to you and not the other way around, mm -hmm. where you're like sharing value and adding things to a community that you've built. Like in a way, when you're in a platform like LinkedIn or social media or Instagram, whatever, you have the power to craft your narrative and your persona, your professional persona in a way that makes sense to you. And then most people can come to you and it's a good way of like highlighting where you want to be. And like, it's very hard to do this in real life, but online you have this opportunity to put yourself where you actually would like to be in like say next year, in two years time or next month. And it's 
totally fine and acceptable to do this but yeah i think we should remove some of the like oh it's pushy it's this like it's you know if you have a clear ask to someone and someone says yes that's because they want that you know they are welcoming that sort of interaction and um if they say no then at least you know that that's not the right person or your ask is not correct like you gain a lot from it way more than just like holding yourself Mm -hmm. back i think so i would yeah but i know what he means and i think there's a lot of people that are there doing their ego trips but that's not really what we i advocate for i don't think that's the way that i use networking in my favor to be entirely honest but you know they have worked for them good for them but yeah i think you don't need to go down that route basically do you have anything to add do i um i would definitely agree about the whole you don't ask you don't get thing like particularly in museums and heritage like it is a very values driven sector most people are here because they really love their subject or they love what they do and they're you know they're very committed to their work because of their kind of interest and the kind of values that they hold and the way that that's reflected in the work um and so i think or i'm I'm just speaking from my own experience i i definitely associate that kind of like warm fuzzy feeling with the idea that then everyone's just going to be like really really nice and no one has to kind of be pushy or kind of advocate for themselves and you'll just be seen for the value that you have and like by a lot in lots of cases that is true but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't also put yourself forward and and kind of you know just show what you can do and make sure that people are aware of the kind of positive things that you're capable of um and like, like LinkedIn, to me, is quite a kind of corporate space. But that doesn't mean that it's the wrong space for someone who wants to work in museums. And it is a really nice way to kind of build a profile where you're just saying, here's, some, you know, here's a blog post I wrote recently, or I wanted to share this project that I'm working on, and you're just kind of you know, resharing someone else's content, but it's all relevant to the work that you're putting out there. I guess there's nothing wrong with that at all. And it can be really helpful to then kind of it's not like a portfolio, but it is at least somewhere that you've got a kind of a presence, especially if you're just starting out, you're just kind of creating a bit of a profile. Um, and also to add, yeah, just to agree that there's nothing wrong with kind of approaching people and asking something of them. I think you don't need to hide that, you just need to be honest about what it is that you want. Mm-hmm. And certainly lots of people who have been in the career for quite a while like, no one that I've ever spoken to has a super linear, really, really easy to predict career path. Everyone's got their, like, weird trajectories. You know, they took a career break, they did this, they trained in that, and then they ended up in a museum. And I'm quite nosy, and I love asking people about their backgrounds and, like, you know, how did you end up doing the job you're doing? And if you ask it in a kind of polite, respectful way, like, most people are very, very happy mm-hmm. to tell you because most people do like telling their story. And particularly if you've got you know, someone who's just starting out, they're keen to learn, they're asking kind of interesting questions and they're clearly interested in what you have to say, that's so flattering. And yeah, if you want to just like go and be a sponge and talk to someone about their career and how they've got there, like, I think that's a really nice thing to ask, giving someone the chance to kind of you know, give a little back, you know, make sure that they're not pulling the ladder up after themselves. Most people in the sector really care about that kind of thing. Um, so you don't have to kind of pretend that you're not asking when you are because it's not a, it's a good ask I would definitely go for it yeah so it's very much about viewing it as um, a two-way relationship rather than asking someone for something yeah, yeah. that's really interesting um, where do you find well, we've talked about LinkedIn but where do you find the best places to network are be that online or kind of at in-person events so i think they're all slightly different i love linkedin it's not for everyone because not everyone is there so it depends who you're talking to the most important thing to consider when you're thinking about starting out with networking is deciding who you first want to talk to and why once you know why and who then you figure out where they are where they're hanging um we as a line networking we have i have my LinkedIn, where, which serves me really well to, f- to get in touch with like new mentors or organizations that we partner and things like that and like sponsors and all of those things. But 
Instagram where we mostly talk to audiences, but we also talk to other like providers and people that run maybe slightly similar things that we run in a way, which I always welcome. I think uh, having people in the same space creates, you know, peers, because if you work on your own, if you're self-employed, I feel like building your network is also like building your work team, you know, finding the colleagues that you want, because sometimes you're going to have to ask someone like, how did you do this taxes or who is your accountant and what software are you using? So it's really valuable to build those relationships. And I think it depends really where you are. But like, I love LinkedIn. Instagram is a really valuable tool because you get a lot of immediate feedback from people. But again, you need to show up there. Like if you see someone posting something that you like, you have to comment, you share, you tell people. Like if someone calls you out on something nicely, hopefully, uh, then you can have the conversation, you can course correct. Like I think it's a very, it can be a very open and positive space as well. But when it comes to, so when you're online, you have a lot of control of who you're talking to and how they are perceiving you, right? Because you control a lot of those elements. In real life, you have to be a little more open. So I think it's more about like, okay, maybe I'll be friends with people here. Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll just learn some interesting stories and absorb something from it. I think when you're in real life, it's good to come thinking that, again, we connect with people through many different things. Maybe you'll end up talking about this Netflix show you're both addicted to, and that will lead to a collaboration in three years' time because you start talking to one another. I think it's important to ask lots of questions, be curious about people's trajectories, and then not try to you know, get too caught up on like, oh my God, is this gonna happen? Is this gonna take me anywhere? Because it's really hard to control those things. And building relationships that last a long time and are valuable is, you know, a work in progress. You don't become best friends and like, no, it's very rarely that you're gonna sell something to someone right away, right? It's people <laughs> need to warm up to you a little bit. But yeah, I would urge everyone before going to a in real life space to think about three things that define them without work. So I usually tell people that I have more passports than Jason Bourne, I'm addicted to coffee, um, and I have a really bad habit of really, really bad television, like reality television. <laughs> and I cannot tell you how many people, professionals, serious professional people, had big conversations with me about which one is the best Real Housewives <laughs> franchise, <laughs> who then became really good collaborators or mentors, you know? So like, you need to remember that you are you before being a manager, an artist, a student, blah, 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 and go in with that sort of energy. I think that makes the experience more enjoyable. But I talk a lot. You go, Georgia. <laughs> I do find that like in-person or kind of job specific networking opportunities have been the best for me um, so I think depending kind of what your interest you know, what what part of museum work are you interested in is it a subject specialism is it a kind of type of practice like you want to work in learning you want to work in exhibitions um, if you kind of just do a bit of internet research you will find that there is usually already a pre-existing network for that specialist interest and you know it brings people from all different stages of their careers all different kind of motivations and backgrounds and stuff, but they're all there because they are working in, interested in, or you're aspiring to be part of a particular type of heritage work. And that is a really, really good place to start. I think hopefully you will have met some of the networks outside. They're excellent advocates for what they do. And it's a very friendly space. Like you're there because you all care about the same stuff. And it's also a nice place to start a conversation because you don't have to kind of be like, oh, I'm this and I'm very impressive because I've done all this stuff. It's just, I'm really interested in this. Please tell me about what you do or let's have an interesting conversation about something in the news recently that's relevant. You know, there's a lot of kind of easy access points when you're all kind of gathered around a central shared interest. Um, and as scary as it is, conferences can be really good for that as well. Um, particularly the kind of sector-wide um, Museums Association Conference. Um, I was too chicken to actually make use of it, but they have a really, really nice um, kind of welcome approach for people who, it's like, if it's your first conference, you can get a special badge and like, it's not to single you out, it's to say like, 
come and talk to me um, and they have kind of specific like kind of social lunches and stuff and like if it's your first time at the conference come have lunch chat to other people and it's just a way of kind of saying yes you're new that's fine welcome we're really glad you're here and like you know we know that this is a bit intimidating so let's try and like create a space where we you know take the edge off a little bit um because it, it is intimidating kind of walking into a new room for the people you don't know um, but after you've met a few people, you can like, you know, it's a familiar face, start with them, maybe feel a bit braver, you know, maybe speak to some new people and just kind of allow yourself to take it slowly and not feel like you have to have five new contacts by the end of the day and like added loads of people on LinkedIn because it's, it's not an arbitrary process. You could just find what works for you. What barriers have each of you experienced in networking? Uh, I think when I first started, I didn't, first of all, first of all it's, a, it's not something that I ever considered that I did for a long time. Although when I was younger, I told myself that I was the LinkedIn for romance because I was a matchmaker, really bad at it. Like, <laughs> I don't think any of the couples I put together stay together. But I tried, so <laughs> there's that. <laughs> So I was like, oh, I'm the Lincoln, I'm the real life LinkedIn for love. Like there was no Tinder in my time. Okay, <laughs> there was no such thing. So, yeah, I I didn't really see it as a thing, but I I think my biggest barrier was actually getting started, like understanding that I needed to meet people and figuring out how to do it. I did not ever have anyone name it. Oh, this is called networking. Like it was just like. You want to work in the arts? Yeah, good luck, bye. <laughs> you know, like just go figure it out. Yeah. And it took me a long time to actually understand like, oh, this is a thing, this is how you do, this is where people hang, this is the conferences you can go to, it just wasn't very clear. Um, I started my professional career in 2004 or 2005, so it's been a while. And things were different back then. Like when I was a talent manager in music for a long time, there was no Spotify, you know? So like things were different in the, uh, how you found the information. We had to fax things to people at one point still. So it's how old I am. But um, yeah, I think there's you know, those, the, the knowing what it is and how to go about it was my first barrier. But like once you, you know, I figured it out, like we can all figure it out because it is in the end about building relationships. I'm just hoping that I can help people to do it in a better way for themselves so that they can open those doors faster or find where they want to be or find a ga their gang or whatever it is, you know, in a more convenient way. But yeah. I think that's a really good question and one I'm not entirely sure how to answer apart from to talk about like, you know, feeling anxious or insecure and kind of not wanting to you know, take the plunge and put yourself out there. But I think one of, I think it's important to kind of talk about when you talk about networking is kind of where networks come from and the link between some networks and nepotism and how, you know, I'm middle class, grew up in London. There, I was in a position to have like my mum's friend, friend, like talk to me about their career when I just left uni and like, I didn't end up really making any use of it, but it was still interesting to hear from someone you know, in their mid, you know, midlife talking about working in the creative industries and just like having access to that information is a massive deal. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get born into that, you have to create that for yourself, which is really, really hard. And I think a lot of the networks that you, know, you will have hopefully talked to outside, they are creating the equivalent of that, but with a kind of specific theme or like you know, subject specialism or kind of group of people like Museum as Mark focusing on working class museum professionals, like they are creating the equivalent of the, the networks that some people kind of get born into, which I think is incredibly important. And it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort and a lot of kind of goodwill and people giving a lot of their time for free, but it's really worth it because everyone knows the value of creating those networks um, and building them. You know, if you think of yourself as just like, you're part of a web of people and not everyone will kind of like come into your life at the same time or be 
you, know, you might kind of know someone for years and then actually like you end up working in a job where you're like oh yeah I remember meeting that person at like a, a work meeting or a conference or like they were a colleague's friend and suddenly you're like oh I'd really like to talk to them about something and like just kind of stealing yourself to reinsert yourself in someone's life like that can be a bit daunting but kind of harking back to what we were saying earlier like most people don't take that as a, a bad thing or an offense because especially if they have met you before, yeah. <laughs> like whether it was years ago or not, you're just like, hey, it'd be great to talk. And if they're too busy or whatever, then that's fine. But um, you know, all of that kind of thing counts because you never know when you might be useful to someone and they might be useful to you. And like, there are definitely people who I've met over my career who like, I didn't come into museums thinking I'd make a load of really good friends. But you know, I've been here for a while now and like most of my really close friends, I did meet through work in one way or another. And it's you just kind of you don't just set out with an agenda to be like oh, I'm building my network today, mm -hmm. but you get on with people. If, if particularly like if you're lucky to have really nice colleagues and you do get on, like it's very natural to kind of learn a bit more about their lives, and you may end up being friends, or you might just end up kind of bumping into each other down the line, and that all that is all part of your network, and you don't have to kind of consciously construct it, but sometimes you need to just realise that actually, even if you didn't start out with one, you have built one just by working and talking to people and being interested. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, really important. Yeah, the, the one of the main things that we do with online and working, especially online, is that we try to bring as many, in, as much information as we can exactly about career paths and how people get into things and what are like the boards and where the because I arrived here I had no idea what to do I didn't know I had never heard of a cover letter in my life did not know what it was like if you told me you had to subscribe to a newsletter I did not know what that was either so it's yeah it can be really daunting and I don't think in a way the creative industries are the most transparent of like oh this is the way in because there are so many different way ins but there's also all the issues that we know we have of like unpaid internships and who you know is how you get things and so it is really uh, like to me it was really hard to like start from scratch but again I I think there's a lot of power in like going and finding those organizations that are doing things and there's so much more information online as well and things you can surround yourself with um, it's not easy to break into something if you have no contact, so that's why you do need to build one for yourself. But it can be something, I agree. like you meet people that you like and then they'll say something, it doesn't need to be like super forced, but as long as you're also bringing your own value to conversations, I think that will move faster in a better way because you'll be joining a conversation in an equal way. And I ask people to also think about job internships, uh, job interviews almost as a partnership conversation as well. Like you have something to bring, they have something to bring, it needs to be that synergy. And yeah, sometimes you're gonna connect with someone online, you're gonna meet them in real life, then you're gonna talk to them. And then like five years down the line, something will come of that conversation. And you know, that's really valuable. But I, I was, I have a lot of trust in networking because in, even though I didn't know anyone when I was starting out here or in Brazil, I at one point, you know, was also thrown into experiences that I was like, what am I going to do? And someone more experienced than me was always kind enough to kind of show me the way or give me a tip or something. And those people, I really attached myself to them, like the people who, you know, we say that if you came all the way up to the elevator and you know there's people down, you at least press the button so it goes all the way down again and people could come back again. So I met a lot of people, not all of them, but a lot of people like this. And I think that's, you know, the pay it forward of the industry that should be. So if you should surround yourself with people like that, hopefully things will be, you know, better. And I'm hoping that more people want to do that as well. But I think there are a lot of people here. There were lots of organizations that are doing that as well. That's great, that's great. Um, and I think now we're going to move on to yeah. audience questions. Okay. So our lovely friends, um, Grace and Sin, have got microphones. What would you say was the most, um, particularly when you were starting out, was the most time efficient way of um, networking, be it sort of digitally or physically? And what, and what did you spend a long time doing that actually didn't amount to much in the end? So I'm wondering about, like, was Twitter more of a hobby compared to actually meeting people or, you know, what was it? 
Um, well, I started out uh, in Brazil, as I'll say. It's a very different, I don't know if anyone here is from Brazil, but it's very different from the UK. We don't have a creative industry. We have creative people trying to survive, basically. But I was born in 86, that was about the end of the dictatorship, so it's not like we have big history of supporting creative outbursts all of our lives. So it's very different scenario than what we have here with like established institutions and arts council and all of those things. So I kind of started working in friends like that worked in film, like doing their sets, like serving coffee and carrying stuff around basically. And that was the most useful in a way because that's how I started meeting people that actually did stuff like that or wanted to do stuff like that for a living because I did not have any role models or people are like, oh, this is how you do. And I just, it at the time there was you know no Instagram. So there was a bit of LinkedIn, I guess at some point, but no one was in there, not back home anyway. And so I had to just meet people face to face. And what I did a lot during that first few years was just putting myself in almost every single opportunity I could and telling people that I wanted to work and I was ready to learn and you know I was very privileged that I could live in my mom's I was living in my parents house where I could like explore a lot so I had a I got a job paid really badly in the, in the gallery and then I did all this freelance stuff stuff on the side and that's how I started meeting people but also knowing what I like to do and how to do it because I didn't have like training to not know like the roles like what is a producer what is this so that to me was the most valuable. Um, and then after a while, I started to understand like where people in my sector would hang out. So I worked, as I said, a lot in music and theater. So that meant that I had to go to a lot of gigs, a lot of plays, a lot of events like that, because that's literally where the deals was, used to be made. Like you would go to a concert at 4 a.m you would meet the manager or whatever, and then you'd have a conversation, and the next day at 9 a.m. you need to be like on your email, like, hey, let's pick that conversation up. That's how things were done. Uh, I think I spent a lot of time wasting time in meetings that didn't go anywhere because I was very insecure and saying no to people, so everyone who wanted to talk to me, I would always say yes. Uh, because I was starting out and I think to be honest that was the biggest time pit because you drive you go and then nothing goes anywhere because I didn't know how to assess what's the you know what is worth my time at the time but once I was already once I was already a little more established and I understood how you know LinkedIn worked and then we had Instagram and other things then I found that really helpful like I found that was a really good investment of my time because you could actually see like you go to the companies you like and you see who works there what roles and it's a lot it was a lot easier than what, what I was doing at the time but I cannot fully compare because when I was starting out there was not there were not that many online tools basically I'm like a little dinosaur so <laughs> I should be here it's both no yeah on okay cool um, my question is more about like um, when it comes to networking a part of that is kind of like selling yourself so I wonder if you have any tips or formulas on how to like present oneself because that's something I personally struggle with it's like oh so like who are you what do you do and it's like um uh, um <laughs> yeah I think that's a really good question um, and we should probably both take turns to answer that because I think you'll have a lot more practical advice than I do but <laughs> The, my biggest tip would be just to remember that the people you're networking with, they may, they may well be more confident than you or they might just seem it, but in my experience, most people are equally as grateful that someone has come up to start a conversation with them as you are. And like, it, it, it's not necessarily just fake it till you make it, but it is kind of just trust that there are like other people in the room will want to meet you and that you're not imposing something on them by going up to them. You're not 
being difficult or awkward by wanting to have a conversation. Actually, most people, particularly if they're standing around at a live event, like they also feel like they need to talk to people. It's like, oh, I must network. And like most people are very much in the same boat with that respect. And like, yeah, I, I <laughs> it's a kind of perhaps unhelpful default assumption that like, oh, I suck at this and everyone else is doing fine. And it's generally not the case and everyone's just there trying to kind of get over their own stuff and put them you know have conversations that are useful and just remembering that I think just kind of grounds you a little bit but just in terms of like it can be helpful to kind of have a you know a list of three things that you know you're comfortable talking about or you know not quite in an elevator pitch for yourself but just kind of if you were thinking about how would my friends describe me or how would I want to describe myself to someone who was interested in meeting me in a professional context and not downplaying the things that you do and that you're, the projects you've worked on and just kind of, it's almost like reading over your CV right before you go into an interview. Like, oh yeah, I did do that. That was really good. And actually I do have a lot to talk about because when you're on the spot, well certainly like my mind can go bl really blank and it's kind of like, you know, what have I done for the last time? <laughs> It's all, you know, how would I pitch myself? I don't know, in this moment, I don't know how I would do it, but it's kind of take a breath and just think about some of the things that you've been part of that you'd be happy talking about and start from there. Yeah, I'd say if you're, it's good practice then to start online because you're forced to have a bit of an elevator pitch of like who you are essentially and the who you are is like who is, like what part of you you're talk is important for that person to understand so that's a good thing and then why are you getting in touch with them and then what you like so that's good and like practicing it out loud i always say this if you read your message out loud and you cringe it's not the correct tone of voice for you <laughs> because ideally you're able to talk your elevator pitch or like in real life to someone in a certain way obviously it's slightly different but not Totally right, um, and I'd say like we all feel like outsiders. I think when it's in real life, and just think that there's a, also another outsider. So one strategy is to then, if you meet someone, ask lots of questions. People like talking about themselves, and that will give you space to like, oh, okay, this is something I can add, and you don't need to come with like, oh, this is exactly who I am. This is what I do, and this is what I can help you with. There are lots of formulas for this, but. Especially when it's online, on real life, you never know what people are going through. Some people don't actually want to talk about work at that time, you know. And online as well, sometimes you'll message people and they won't reply. And you'll be like, oh my god, it's all on me. And then they'll come back through a story six months later and be like, I'm so sorry, I just had a given birth to twins. You know, <laughs> you don't know what's going on like with yeah. people's lives. So you've got to take some of that weight from yourself that everyone is going through the same. It's, it's that idea that you go to the beach thinking, oh my god, everyone's thinking about my body in this bikini or the swimsuit, whatever, and everyone else is looking at their own like belly button, like, oh my god, everyone is looking <laughs> at my... You know, it's the same. So, like, that's... Keep that in mind, that you have always been you in spite of... or in addition to what you do professionally, and that's already enough to come into any space, you know? So that's a good way, I guess, to frame it. What recommendations do you have for continuing the relationship? So you've met somebody, networking, things are great. Uh, how do you maintain that over the next, I don't know, three months? Like, do you email them? How, what kind of schedule does that look like? What are your recommendations on that front? Um, I can go start. Um, I, I, okay, I have crazy organization systems. I don't want to recommend them all to everyone. Like, I think if you add them on LinkedIn or Instagram, as I said, if you're always feeding, like I have a schedule, like I go in in the morning, I read what's going on, I comment on a few things, I try to share interesting research around. I only talk about like three content pillars on my LinkedIn and my so and social media. So like choose what sort of topics you want to talk about that's helpful. And I just go in and make sure that I'm talking to people. And every so often I have a schedule on my calendar to review LinkedIn connections and messages and go through it a little bit more in detail. Um, if I met someone and I emailed them, I love a good snooze button on Google or like Outlook, whatever. So you send someone a conversation like I should probably pick this conversation back up in three months and you snooze, it comes back to your inbox. So I do that. I know a lot of people that have spreadsheets 
where they organize their contacts. I don't work that way very much, but I think you just find a way that works for you. But the easiest way is to make sure, honestly, that you're adding value to a conversation in the content in whatever way that you're creating that space for yourself. It's Twitter, it's, I don't know, TikTok, like whatever for, uh, platform you're using that you're, you know, bringing you as well to the table. Like there's so much value in saying things, for instance, like, oh, I just found out like this really great alternative to Photoshop and this is how I found, this is what's the best, this is the con, or asking questions to your network and then sharing what you've learned or, you know, if you're a graphic designer, you're like, actually, I'm happy to support, like do, I don't know, pro bono work for a small charity or help review someone's portfolio. There's so much you can do that will help you start conversations and keep yourself in mind and like attract the correct people to come talk to you as well. But I'd say show up authentically and it's better to show up to five people at a time than to sh not show up and not collaborate and not bring your voice to anything, uh, to 10,000 people, you know? It's like, we work on a people to people basis, like that's how it all like operates, right? So, say, but yeah, I love a snooze button. It's my t tip. <laughs> <laughs> that, is a, that is a really good idea. Yeah. yeah keep snooze, it. I didn't know that was a thing, the snooze uh, button. Oh yeah, it comes yeah. back to your inbox. That's so good. No clue. <laughs> Definitely check that out. Yeah. So thank you both uh, so thank much you. for uh, coming and speaking and sharing uh, such brilliant insights today. Um, I definitely really appreciate it. And, uh, thank you. Appreciate yeah, so much. It. I mean, I definitely. Yeah. Want to clap. yeah. <laughs> Feel free to clap. <laughs> thank you for sticking with us on a Saturday. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, like on in regards to that again, thank you, thank you guys, and as well, thank you to the stall holders. Don't know if any of you guys are there. See you next. Come back. <laughs> um,